Charlie, can we just first talk about the fact that you were in the Zoom waiting room for 30 seconds, close to a minute? I know you're there because yeah. I get an email saying Charlie has joined the Zoom, if that is your real name, the Zoom waiting room. So Zoom knows you're there. Yeah. I know that Zoom knows you're there. I mean, you're saying you, call. you just left me there. You let you left me there hanging. Is that is that where you're going to? You're not showing up in the list of participants. You've not noticed this in Zoom. There's no. this huge lag. Zoom knows that you're there. One of the servers knows that you're there because they could send an email. Yeah. But due to humans writing software, there's wow. like a tens of seconds latency before you show up. And you think I'm being rude by not letting you in when really yeah, I had to. I had to ping you separately. Do you have any students at Zoom that uh, you could help or point them to this issue? No, it's one of the things where I've got to like take the job, fix the thing and then quit. Cause it's been like this for at least two years that I've <laughs> noticed. It's one of my biggest frustrations. It's like, you know what we could have done in those 20 seconds? Well, not us, cause we waste time, but computers. Okay. What yeah, could have been achieved in 20 seconds? Holy crap. It's a shame. I mean, we're losing these seconds every day. Every Imagine how many Zoom calls. Uh, the wasted potential. That's that sort of thing. Do you know how expensive this meeting is? People love saying that. Uh, yeah, it's this just waiting it, room is just as bad. How it's just how they're not embarrassed that that's that's the thing. It's like actually, can I can I admit something that I do? It's uh, we use Google Hangouts in other circumstances and things like that. And there's often a lot of people, and you can see the little bubbles of who's in there. And sometimes I'm just like, okay. I can't join if it's just this person or just this other person. I, and I, I have to kind of wait for a critical mass. Or sometimes if I see the person, I'm like, oh, I haven't caught up with this person forever. Let me dive in. But the sort of exposed waiting room thing, there, I'm sure there's all this strangeness going on. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm always on time for meetings. Don't worry, uh, even, if, even if Zoom doesn't tell you that. I just can't handle that the software is so bad. Like there's somewhere there's a line of code that's like, well, uh, every 30 seconds, let's check to see from this server if there are participants. It's like, just poll if more it, frequently. Hey, awesome, All you can manage is polling. Just poll more frequently. If it ain't broke, we're using it. We're still using it. What's better than this? Are you going to have to write your own? Yeah. I use Stripe and you pull up the Stripe mobile app. Like maybe they just don't care about the mobile app, but why even have it in the app store? You pull up the Stripe mobile app and it takes a minute to load your data. If you're like, oh, you know, how many transactions or whatever we do we have for the day? Like the default screen when you open it up takes a minute. It's just for me, that's like it's probably because there's so many transactions and it's like <laughs> it's just you're just counting up those recurring revenue things, man. And also, should you really be looking at that in the moment? That should be a thing where you sit down at the end of a great day of teaching online. You have a cup of tea and you're, you can just you're a, the thing, wait and see it roll in. You're a software performance uh, apologist, Charlie. Right. Well, I mean, you see the old computers here. I'm, uh, I just am reminiscent of the 56K modem, if not earlier eras. Yeah, but you know, 56K, you could still ship 56K per second over that modem. Also, that, that also makes me think of that trend of, have you seen plain text sports? No, what's that? It's a website, a plain text website that gives you live sports updates with no CSS, no cruft whatsoever. So if you need to know, blah, 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 who's playing, what's winning, it's right there. And it, it feels very much like a Unix program, but it's just shipped over the web and it's pretty fast. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. More things like that would be good. Yeah, but the That's same whole... thing with Stripe is like, if that is a minute like it doesn't matter that it's graphics by the way the graphics are already there i already downloaded the app like yeah how, how much text could there possibly be like a, a few thousand bytes and you know you're talking about your modem's throughput it's not a throughput thing it's a latency thing because i'm not seeing anything yeah. i'm seeing zero it's not that it starts in the first second and then you know it's ready by however i mean i gotta just stop ranting about this stuff so. <laughs> Charlie, do you know, um, like, let's, I mean, let's think about it this way. If yeah. you are sending data around the world, how long does it need to take? Like, what is due to the speed of light limitation? Oh, God. Minimum. I know. There, again, there's a, there's, you've told me this so many times and I forget. I'm going to say half a second. 
half a second to do like a trip around the around the world. The world. Yeah. Yeah, that's a reasonable approximation for a, okay. for a network packet. But yeah. speed of light, uh, well, thanks to the speed of light, you could send a photon around the Earth seven times. So this is this is my my rule of thumb for first principles thinking. Okay. Like light, light could go around the equator seven times in one second. Okay. And a network packet, like you know, if it's going mostly across the ocean, it's going to get pretty close to that. If it's going through a it, bunch it's of going routers, through fiber, yeah, yeah. If it's going through a bunch of routers, and it's not really like the physical medium of the link. It's more like how many hops at how many hops does it has to have to wait in a queue to be forwarded. Right. Well, let's say right. it's going from the west coast to the east coast of the U.S. It hits ten routers along the way. Uh, maybe the overhead of going over the network is going to be like one x. So if this if the speed of light would allow you to get across the U.S. in forty milliseconds, instead it's going to take eighty milliseconds. Yeah. Uh, so that's a reasonable rule of thumb as well. It takes twice. Okay. Okay, but for Stripe to get it from a server anywhere in the in the world, to me, like it should be max of. 500 milliseconds yeah we shouldn't be sitting there for a minute to see something it's just ridiculous so what's what like what's the root causing here i maybe i'm maybe i'm not thinking about the wrong place because the my mind went to I, one problem i've always seen is like okay if we have this beautiful uh rest api endpoints i now need to make like seven different requests for these things or maybe uh, instead of that model i like have one big heavy thing that's doing a lot of like backend aggregation just in time. Maybe I haven't like cached the response. Am I thinking about the wrong like surface area of where this problem lies? Oh yeah, I mean it's some it's something like that. We don't know exactly. Yeah. You'd have you know we can run the wide chart and yeah. figure it out. But yeah. but um, uh, yeah, it's bad software. Like it's bad programming. That's like ultimately what it is. Yeah, it's not physics. It's not limitations of anything of the. Of the hardware of of uh, the laws of physics that we have, it's like it's bad programming. It's human. Yeah. Yeah. But again, maybe you just need to be more patient, Oz, and uh, <laughs> conciliatory. No, it's. Uh, I just delete. I just deleted the app. I'm just like, hey, you guys are not good at mobile apps. Thank God the web dashboard works. I'm just not going to use that thing. Just take it off the app store. How it's Stripe. They're pull... supposed to have good engineers. They have a lot of engineers. Yeah, they have a really good design. I did a project. Uh, I did a project, a Chat GPT project, to try it out, and I had this idea forever. Where I was, I'm gonna make a little GIF maker with Wayback Machine and show home pages over time. And I did Apple, and I can talk about how Chat GPT helped. But I did Apple, and that was really fun and interesting because Apple's website they have snapshots back to mid '90s and things like that, and you can just see this adorable web design where everything was like perfectly visible in view source, right? Click view source. Like you can see all the tables and all that stuff and seeing that evolve has been fun. But I also thought like to me, Stripe, they are, they're setting the standard for what SaaS app uh, marketing landing pages have to look like. And it was fun seeing that over time. And I, you know what, they make a, they make a beautiful site, Oz. You can't fault them for that. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. No, it's okay. not what I need from them, but that's great. Yeah, good on them. <laughs> yeah, I do. I did want to ask you about ChatGPT, and maybe uh, one lens for this is I started CS Primer, signed up, and I'm playing with the first problem, and I'm doing it pretty slowly, I'm trying to be deliberate, and I'm sort of at this mode right now, which I could use some advice on. Is when when you advise people to go, okay, now you've understood the prompt, go tackle the problem. In my mind, I feel like I could tackle that a lot of different ways. And I'm wondering what counts as cheating. Like on the spectrum of cheating to not, cheating could be like asking chat GPT to do it. And then maybe less is like Googling for some library that could help me, I don't know, manipulate a certain type of no unsigned integer or something like that. Maybe there's some library package that could help. Then I think the things that you would like are like, if it's in, if you can search for it in the man using the man command, then you're okay. Like if you're searching the way that they could search in the 80s and 90s, Oz would say that's okay. So I'm wondering like that spectrum of where the learning can happen. How do, how do you, how do I feel? How should I feel about that? So I think, I mean, putting CS Prime or whatever aside, I think you're yeah. asking like as a software engineer, how you, how should I be trying to improve my understanding of what I work with? 
Yeah, kind of. Um, and the, but sometimes I have this tension of, I just need to solve this problem quickly. So my reaction might be different. And other times maybe I have, I have the space to try to explore and get better at what I do. So next time I'm, I'm, I understand it. So I'm just looking for guidance in that. Yeah. I mean, I, I understand you've got a job, you've got to like do your job. Uh, there's a limited amount of time that you have and like, you've got a certain set of skills right now. There's only so much that you can do. Um, but at least over time, you should be striving to directly answer questions yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Like your car breaks down. Ideally, you should be in a position where you can pop the hood, look, diagnose it, figure it out, solve it. Okay, I'm not a car guy. I ask the mechanic. That means I got to trust the mechanic. Yeah. Uh, if I like ask a service which queries a mechanic, if I ask an AI which uh, has like stuff that's generated from mechanics on the web or whatever, like each of those is a step <laughs> further away from answering my own question. I mean, yeah. I'm not a car guy, so I'm still going to do that. But yeah. if I were, if I wanted to be a professional mechanic, if I enjoy cars and want to do more of that and enjoy it more over time, then I'm going to want to get closer and closer to the metal, so to speak. And that's that's how it is with software engineering. And I, like I try and teach people the tools that they need to understand uh, what it is that they're even looking at. And so, you know, like I, I'm in that special moment with a lot of so software engineers where I'm like, you know that you can just look in the registers? Like, you know that we can just execute this program one instruction at, this, at a time and see the state of the program update? Or, you know, we can just capture the packets on the wire and look at them or yeah. we, can, we can trace this we can trace the system calls we can trace every single function that the kernel is invoking on the way to performing this thing that is totally mysterious to you and we can figure it out um so that's fantastic i think but it is a process to get there yeah. and like if you are not in a position where any of this stuff makes sense and i'm like hey let's uh, trace let's trace through the entire kernel. Uh, yeah. It's just going to be way too overwhelming and you're going to want to Google it or whatever. But the thing is, I can do some of those things relatively quickly now because I have had that practice. And I mean, obviously I need to do more practice than I'd like to. Um, but uh, if you if you never do that, then you're never going to get good enough at that, that it even seems like a thing that's reasonable to do rather than Googling or asking a, a large language model or something yeah well the the mechanic thing made me think and this is uh i love you know i love sci-fi as you know but in the star wars universe everyone is sort of adept at these lower level things in like so many interesting domains in order to survive in the star wars universe you have to be a pilot you have to be a mechanic you need to be able to speak like a couple languages including speaking droid you have to also know how to like navigate the black market and they are these amazing jack of all trades in so many interesting areas where if i'm thrown into the star wars universe i'm toast but i i wonder what what is the educational experience that gives you han solo and i, I guess we saw that movie at least i saw that movie and it was it was the origin tale was not uh well delivered but I would, I personally would love to be in that environment where like, Charlie, you have to figure out how to do all this stuff to like, imagine we're going to throw you in star Wars in a year and a half. You need to become adept at all these things. I think that would be so fun for me. So I'm totally lost here, believe it or not, despite my love of uh, sci-fi, no star Wars, just not, You've I've never, never seen, seen even one star war. There's just not. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So just so you know, <laughs> you're going to have to rephrase that. Different enough. Okay. It's more, it's more like the piercing of the, many of us can like recognize that there's a problem in some system, your car or your plumbing, and like maybe die, like sort of noticing a problem is one layer. Then a low, uh, the next layer down is like, okay, what might've caused this leak? What might've caused this thing? Then there's like fixing it. And then there's building it from scratch. My, my suggestion is, uh, in star Wars, many people go deep all the way down to that layer. Whereas I think in the real world, I think we're lucky if we can go deep on any one of these layers. Like maybe, sure, doctors have gone three layers down. They can recognize, sort of figure it out, maybe fix it and come back out. Uh, I think what you're doing with computer science and helping people unlock that is helping them, hey, I noticed there's these bugs and I don't know what to do. And you're saying, look, you can look, you can look within. 
look within and you can find it. And I think that's nice. Um, and I wish I had that in almost everything that I'm interested in. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, it takes time. Uh, so, yeah. and, uh, if you're not, if you're not that interested in it, if you've got a passing interest in it, then, you know, you not you're not going to have the opportunity or the motivation to go deeper, but like coming back to chat GBT, like obviously a lot of yeah. people are wondering what is the future of software engineering, whatever, if you've got tools like this yeah. and, uh, look, like absolutely nothing changes from the perspective of people who want to understand the systems that they're working with better so that they can do cutting edge work. Like no one at the cutting edge is like, Oh, well now there's this thing that summarizes other people's crap on the web. Like no offense, but you know, if you just, if you just train a model on stuff that exists online, that's going to be way better than the average engineer probably at answering certain questions. Not the, the not the standard I'm aiming for. I don't want to be way better than oh, average engineer. I want have to you like seen what people write people. online. Like it's it's people can write anything. There's no quality I control. Yeah. I mean, googling for stuff is bad enough. I feel like yeah, that people ask me about ChatGPT, and I'm like, I'm already telling people not to Google for the answer. Like I'm already saying that the Stack Overflow answer is wrong or misleading, or that like you could read it and it maybe accidentally fixes your immediate problem. Uh, but you've not actually understood what the issue was or you've misinterpreted that or misapplied that. And most of all, you've missed an opportunity to actually improve at this thing that you ostensibly want to get better at. Right. Like you've not improved by looking at someone's Stack Overflow answer. If you like, this was a perfect excuse, this thing, whatever that we're imagining was a perfect yeah, excuse yeah. for you to finally hex dump your Postgres heap file and look at it and answer your question that way this was the motivating example and you yeah. you drop that because you went and asked stack overflow instead but maybe you're maybe you're going to get a motivating least... example you're never going to learn that thing and so next time you know you're not going to do it sometimes you're in that sort of repl state where it's like do this found this bug what's going on i fixed it etc cetera, etc cetera. i think if i was going to do that and stop i probably need to like physically just walk step away from the computer for a moment and like write down a plan, like a poly a plan of attack and actually be deliberate about saying, okay, I'm not just going to like try to hunt and peck for this answer. I'm going to actually stop. And I think that's like, again, I keep saying failure mode, but failure mode of mine is, okay, how do I, how do I slap a bandaid on this and move on to the next thing? Cause I've got some higher level objective. Um, and I want to be able to do that, but I think I'm, I don't allow myself that space to step away. Yeah, it's um, it is it is tricky. Yeah, because you're yeah. like you're an employee. You, if there's an expectation that you're productive in a certain way, your yeah. employer actually does not care whether you grow. You know, that's like let's be honest. Typically, people are not sticking around long enough for the growth to matter. In fact, if you're growing, you're growing out of the role that they hired you for, and they're going to be lucky if they can you know promote you into something that they mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Like. If, forget the L and D budget or whatever, your employee does not want you to grow. And so that's up to you. And uh, look, you can find excuses at work. I, one that I suggest a lot of the time to students is like, find the neglected thing that people would value, but that seems too hard or too annoying and do that. So let's yeah. say there are a bunch of uh, log messages and people are like, ah, oh, well, you know, a fraction of the a percent of the time we get this data integrity issue and uh, like, it's not annoying enough for users that we need to fix it, but it is coming and no one understands why. Yeah. Do that, do that one because you're going to be wrong. That should be an alarm bell for you. Yeah. If you're trying to learn. Yeah. yeah it's that, that should seem juicy to you. You should be like, ah, oh, that's a thing that other people don't want to take on for whatever reason. And I would need to learn stuff in order to solve it. And it is valuable for my company um you know it, like it is something that is going to be rewarded so i'm going to do that performance is another one it's like uh our the performance in this area has gone worse and worse over time someone did a podcast and they complained about how it takes a second a uh, minute to load the dashboard maybe <laughs> like uh maybe once 10 people do podcasts like that they'll uh we'll fix it yeah uh, so identify things like that and be like i'm going to fix this now and uh, make that your job so you can do it out but um I was just Sometimes it's remember like we, you got you to do it on the weekends. You know? Yeah, you got to do it on the weekend. But remember we talked to Richie a couple of years ago, one of your other students. I feel like Richie is like the is the perfect example of this. 
he had something and he wrote a whole blog post about it. I think where uh, there was something wrong um, in the Golang spec or something like that. And he was doing all this sort of like flame graph analysis. And to me, that just like unlocked this entire new career direction for him. Uh, and I, I want to talk, I feel like I need to talk to Richie again and understand how he found the space to do that sort of work. Yeah, let's get him. Let's let's get him yeah. on. But I mean, I know I know how he did it at the beginning, at least. Like he, yeah. he just spent a lot of time and studied. Like he was reading textbooks, reading papers, doing doing courses, and uh, working that into his job. Like obviously, he had to hustle at work in order to get himself into a position in order to be able to use that. But once he had that feedback loop going, you know, yeah, he was, he was off. But yeah, so, he wasn't you, sticking around waiting for Uber to teach him to be a better engineer. Like he was figuring that out and like fighting to yeah. be able to use his stuff at work. Yeah, I like I I'm going to I'm going to think about the the alarm bells and try to this to me to connect to last week where Hamming's talking about what are the great problems in my space. I wouldn't say that these log messages are the great problem in my field, but it's akin to these little things that I could go and explore and tackle and maybe they grow for me. So I should probably do a better job of like collecting these little ideas. Yeah. Um, they're gifts, those issues. They're like, the uh, they're a real reward. Yeah. I, I had so, this come up in another way and like I have distinct uh, memories of um, employees or like people on my team talking about this kind of thing and students as well. They're like Oz, I feel like I'm not growing at work because I'm not challenged. I'm doing routine work, whatever way, like it's feature development. And I've been doing this for a while and I'm not challenged. You know, one response to that is to like break out of it, you know, escape it and go and do something else. Another one is to say, well, like, let's say theoretically you can't switch jobs. You just got to make the most of what you have now. Make things harder for yourself. Okay. Make things harder for yourself. What do you mean? Uh, set a high bar increase the challenge speaking of flow again increase the challenge so that the challenge you know steps up to your abilities right usually we think about how can i step my abilities up to the challenge but sometimes it's the other way around and you're going to get back into a flow state and uh, and have it be fun if you make the task harder for yourself okay you're not going to make it just arbitrarily harder but what if yeah. you say hey our standard for this thing should be that Everything on the web page is rendered within 50 milliseconds. Like that's our goal. That's hard now. That's very hard. Uh, okay, maybe it's too hard, and you say 100 milliseconds. Whatever. You like you find some point where it seems just beyond your reach, and you're like, hmm. The company doesn't require this standard from me, but if I managed to do this in a way where it met this standard, that would cause me to have to grow into that capability, and it's like. It's not wasted time. The company is going to value. He's going to be happy. I can assure you, they're going to be happy, and they're going to thank you for your foresight. Yeah, I mean, look, eighty percent of your colleagues aren't doing anything anyway. Like that's just the, that's just the nature of work. So just by shipping anything, you're going to be like at an advantage. Um, and uh, look, there are probably people who just think it's too hard to do that, impossible to do that, and uh, you stepped up and solved it. Maybe set an example for others as well. But having What's like. A quality What's the right time scale uh, is for these sort of problems. And maybe if you're beginning, you're trying to set the scope for this will take me a day or this will take me one sprint or this will take me a quarter. Uh, do you have advice for that? I think I think it's too context uh, dependent. Okay. Yeah, maybe it's like, you know, I've got this thing and if I don't ship this feature, I get fired. I mean, it's yeah. never that simple, but just imagine like you got to do this boring thing and it's a feature and it's like, well, I've got a week to do it. I think I can squeeze half a day of performance work into this. That's not critical for me to ship, but like due to my self-respect or interest in growing, I will still do this yeah. and squeeze it in and find a way to do that. Um, or maybe it's like, well, I just don't have enough time at work to make that happen. And I do it on the weekend or whatever. Um, but at least that makes the whole week more interesting to you because now you're working to a higher standard and and you're thinking in the context of like well how can i achieve this thing that's too hard rather than routine and time consuming it's like you know a lot of it's time consuming a little bit of, of it is non-routine and uh, challenging mm -hmm. because you've arbitrarily made it harder for yourself that kind of makes the whole project a little bit more interesting in my opinion yeah the um the 
thing I was asking about at the beginning with the where's the right angle to sort of attack a problem that you're throwing out there made me think of another project that I was working on. It was a course suggested by a good buddy of mine who's he he left the company he was working at and now he's in Web3 and he's all in that whole world. And he said, there's this cool course where they're trying to have you recreate the instruction set for the Ethereum virtual machine. And the test uh, or the course is just a bunch of failing tests. And then you have to basically uh, run through the tests and implement each of the instructions in the instruction set. And it's pretty fun. And they sort of like build on each other. And it was great. But one of the things in that case was you had to manipulate unsigned 256 bit numbers. And I think depending on your language, there were these libraries, open source libraries that could like take care of a lot of that for you. And me approaching this, using it as a learning opportunity, I spent a lot of time stressing out about, okay, should I use one of these libraries or not? Or should I manually figure out how to create these numbers using things that are in the standard library or something like that? And maybe that'll force me to better understand one's complement or two's complement and things like that. And I think what I'm taking away is meeting your skill level, meeting the challenge. It might've been a challenge alone just to use that library that helped me there and you know get some momentum under my feet. And then if I want to, I peel back the layer and then I say, okay, well, I, I solved this problem, what's going on with this library and could I have done it without that? So I, I bring that up to say, that is a, that's a pattern I fall, find myself falling into where I worry, am I actually learning? Am I solving the problem? This comes in, This comes in both work, but also when I'm actually, I've carved out this time to learn and am I learning the right way? I'm I'm sort of psyching myself out about that. Yeah, I mean, you, you just got to find the like the channel uh, that uh, allows you to stay in flow. It's as simple as that. Um, I'm That's just it. trying okay. to pull up pull up the chart here. Um, but uh, you know, one one way of answering this is to say your your next um, decision is not your final decision about that. So if you're conscious okay. about like the the kind of feedback loop you're trying to create, what you're trying to learn, what um, uh, let's see, I'm almost ready to share my screen here. The uh, yeah. I'm very bad at multitasking too, by the way. But here we I go. thought I thought you were just reading another. I don't know, maybe you're reading a textbook or something off screen while I was rambling. No, no, I wouldn't do that to you. Okay. So, oh, I love it. Okay. This this is the thing. Like you just got to stay within this channel. Uh, obviously, it's an oversimplification. Oh my god, I can't believe I ended up at some kind of marketing thing. I don't even know what it is, but I just like follow the Google image search to here, and it's got banners and productivity tips and so on. Oh, I feel so bad about this. Can I just okay? Let's do this. No, yeah, you got to sign up for sign up for the mailing list. Come on. No, okay, I'm glad you've escaped. This could be the first thing we ever edit out of a a video. <laughs> Just yeah, we don't know who this person is. Yeah. Okay. This is this is you. The... You could have just drawn this, by the way. You could have drawn the. Uh, I know. With your little iPad thing. Next yeah. time. Oh look, this it's still Next in time. the. Can I hide that? No, I can't. Ah. Oh. No. Uh, Run, ignore that. Okay. The, the fact that this was from. You're welcome. You're welcome, Dan. Can you pull the window higher so we can't see the? Top? I tried to. No, I can't do that. Okay. All right. Uh. Anyway. Look, like, let's say you're down here. That means the difficulty is too hard for your skill level. Like you are currently trying to do this thing by hand, which you cannot do by hand. You can reduce the difficulty by using a third party library. Yeah. Okay. And that will get you back into the flow state. And that's this movement, right? Reduce difficulty, get out of anxiety. Or you can say, hey, if I had certain skills, I can move this way towards flow. That's the, that's the ideal. You know, yeah. maybe in the interim, you want to reduce difficulty of task to get back to flow. That's your that's that's your short term goal. But ideally, you want to be in a situation where by improving your skill level, the same challenge brings you flow. Yeah, I I wonder how often like where time is and are you ever like sometimes I feel like I'm not moving in this chart. And that's yeah, where you, that's you need to yeah. at least be, you need to at least have some movement. If you just get stuck in anxiety or boredom, then that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
No, I, I like that answer to the library because if the library gets you back in that state where you're moving forward, it, you'll uncover another problem. So that, I think when I was working on that, that's how I handled that. Um, I should just, I shouldn't stress myself out about how, I, I mean, okay, let me, let me play that back. I was about to say, I shouldn't stress myself out about how I'm learning. And yet Elliot and you have described, there is a correct way to read a textbook. So I feel I, it's a little bit mixed. Like I could read this textbook and feel like, okay, I understand what I've read here. And then I shut the book and I've immediately forgotten it. So uh, I've lowered the difficulty, but I haven't retained anything. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You 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 would like to improve your skill level at the task. It's not just about like, okay. otherwise you end up playing games or something, right? Like you, yeah. you were, uh, you know, doing Sudoku or whatever. It's like, okay, low skill, low stress, low difficulty. You're in flow, cool. Uh, the, um, you know, for us, I personally feel like improving my skill level over time I don't know. I I find it weird. Like you, you play tennis, right? But did I, I get play? That right? No, I play ping pong. But you play ping pong. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Table tennis. Table tennis. <laughs> I didn't actually. And I've also that. I've obviously picked up pickleball. I am a millennial in the United States, so I've been playing pickle. I don't know if uh, if you're aware of that trend. I am. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's making its way over here. It's yeah. You probably you probably hear it even <laughs> from where you are. Uh. So like some people play these things, tennis, golf, whatever, and they play for two decades and don't get better and have fun. I guess I, I guess I understand that. I'm trying to say this in a way where my voice is not breaking and I'm not like being too rude to anyone. <laughs> I guess I understand that. For me personally, if I'm, if I'm getting better, that's really satisfying. Like, yeah. you know, jujitsu is my sport. If I, if someone gets me with something, like they use technique to beat me at something, I like that is in my head. And I go home thinking, oh, how can I, how is it that they got that? How can I fix that? Like, how can I address that part of my game? Yeah. I'll go and look at what other people do. I'll go back to training and like try certain techniques with other people. Uh, and then go back to that guy and figure it out. And that's so satisfying for me. That growth is part of the fun. But I could also find flow, I guess, by not rolling with that guy again and and uh, or like not caring or something. Yeah. Uh, and uh, like picking on the like the beginners or something like that. I just could, I don't understand that. Uh, How do you know that you're attacking that if you got rolled in some weird way? How do you do you talk to the person after? And the person say the way you dipped your shoulder at that moment, I got you. Or is it more like that's not allowed in the sport and you have to like shamefully go to your corner and then YouTube things and try to maybe watch the tapes or figure uh, out. Yeah, it's it's allowed and encouraged, but okay. definitely for me, I mean, it depends who, who it's with and like what it was about. But uh, for me, sometimes I'm like, oh, don't tell me. Like I gotta, I gotta figure it out. Actually, I had this experience most clearly with Tom Alcorn. The you know the math uh, teacher at Bradfield. I don't know if you met him, but I don't know have him on the Tom. show as well. Okay. Uh, Tom. Um, Tom is a math guy. He was a math major, and um, okay. I remember at at Bradfield one day we got nerd sniped on a problem. Like he was just kind of thinking about something, and there was a whiteboard there, and uh, he like laid the problem out to me, and um, and we just like couldn't help we couldn't help it we had to both drop what we were doing we're there to talk about something else and like yeah. for an hour we're tinkering with this problem and a number of times i'm like uh yeah i'm not sure about this we could like look it up and tom's like no don't, don't look it up we're having so much fun man yeah <laughs> so yeah so like i like sometimes to go home and, and try and figure it out myself um and uh but uh, yeah, sometimes you're just like, hey, you know, how did you, I don't understand how you did that. And you get that quicker feedback loop and incorporate it and that's fine. Yeah, I mean, not to not a, to beat a dead horse, but let's say I'm attacking some problem. Where are the places that it's okay to search? And is is this search a spectrum? You, I feel like when we talk, you always say, okay, pull it up in the debugger, do this. That's probably clean. Then there's like, look at the man pages. Are that, are, are those safe spaces? And then when you get into the internet, that's where like the giveaways can happen. 
I don't think you should set hard and fast rules for this, but okay. um, the way at least I try to approach it is that if there's pedagogical value in pursuing something, uh, I will do that. Uh, you know, obviously with caveats, if it's going to take hours to solve instead of minutes, and then that's going to buy me like, you know, over my lifetime, the possibility of a few minutes of productivity improvement, I'm not going to bother. Right. So an example of that may be I'm trying to figure this thing out with a technology that's comparable to something that I know a lot better. And I could figure it out from scratch by reading the source code. Like, let's say I was thrown into a, uh, I know, OCaml code base. And I'm yeah. like, oh, I don't know OCaml. I know Haskell. I could read the details of this thing. I could read the disassembly, whatever. The end result of that is maybe... Like, I definitely know that the answer is X. I know how to work through this code base. I know a bunch of things in this ecosystem that I didn't know before. But if I'm not going to work in OCaml a whole bunch, that's maybe that's maybe not really fruitful. And I'd rather just Google and say, hey, what is the OCaml equivalent of this Haskell thing? In fact, one of my favorite ways to be thrown into a new code base is to pull up uh, Hyper Polyglot. Do you know that website? No. Now I get it. Bring that yeah, up. Pull it up. Pull it up. It's great. Okay. I'm going to first. I thought, I thought you were going to say do advent of code in a new. Uh, I mean, yeah, new... that's like, yeah. that's that's a way if you actually want to learn it. But I'm saying, yeah. you know, what if I don't actually really want to learn it? Is this a website that's going to show me how to insert into a re an array in every language? Uh. Yeah, similar. There's also that Rosetta code where it's like, okay. uh, you know, here, this is how you do a base 64 encoding or whatever in a hundred different languages. That's, yeah. that's pretty good as well. Um, but this is like, uh, what's this? Okay, here we go. This is, this is my example, right? I like this because I'm like, well, I know one language in each of these language families, surely from this, from this list. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard to know one from each. Well, that you care about, I, like Fortran, APL, whatever. That's that's up to you whether you decide that you care about that. Why have they got Fortran and APL together? What's APL? APL stands for a programming language. <laughs> <laughs> APL that's, is that's great. Uh, this is let's we got a this is a bit of a divergence. Okay. But, uh, what you need to see in APL. Ah, uh, it's not so illustrative here, but these these are kinds of programs, APL programs. Oh, you might. Yeah, I'm seeing some symbols. That's fantastic. Oh yeah, you need a special keyboard to be able to productively write an APL. Is, is APL a modern language or is this an, is this an old? It is an older language. Um, okay. The versions, there are two versions of APL, two derivatives of APL that really they should have as columns here that you might care about in a modern context. They called J and K. Uh, you might be inferring from here that the people in these languages like to have succinct, expressive uh, programs. With uh, they do not have the the Ruby thing of a, a function name that's thirty characters long or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So there is more of a mathematical notation kind of uh, culture. But um, look, you'll have to while I have this screen up, you'll have to um, uh, find some examples of APL programs, but it is. Well, this needs to connect succinct. to rep. This needs to con uh, connect to replit or something. So you can just play. I'm sure replit has APL uh, in their environments that we could play with. That would, yeah, that would be cool. That'd be cool. Okay. So you, basically your, your takeaway here is I know how to do this. I know this is related. I might pull this up and do this. I wonder if there's this sort of like foot gun problem in here. It's like, okay, this is how you do this, but you have to know some other horrible thing happens in F sharp versus Haskell if you do this. And maybe that maybe that's not the case, but sorry, don't 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 follow it. I basically like, okay, yeah, you can you can like scroll down a little bit. Let's see. I, my in my imagination, it's like, okay, yeah, you can write a you can write a for loop like this in this language. You know this one, you can write it this way, but there's some idiosyncrasy about for loops and how they work in the middle language that you're not familiar with that you might assume works the same way. That's that's my concern. Oh yeah, that's definitely gonna be yeah. a concern. And I mean, yeah. this is the kind of thing that ChatGPT is fantastic at. 
You're like, I've got this Haskell code rewrite it in OCaml. And yeah. like, to me, you know, if you don't actually care that much about OCaml, you don't need your program to necessarily be correct. You don't need it to be maintainable, but you're trying to like get something done. Uh, then, you know, taking this approach of like mentally translating and not really understanding whether you do it by hand or through chat GPT. That's like, that's what you're going to do, I guess. But look, if you're the person who, you know, you're going to start working at a company that uses OCaml or you're like, you're setting yourself up to do this, you know, longer term, then yeah. like, this is just a starting point. After this, you okay. got you got to peel back the layers and get better. Because otherwise, yeah, you're totally, you're totally going to get full gun. Of course you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have another insecurity, which it, with the chat GPT stuff is you're going to be left behind if you don't learn how to encant correctly with these things. And, uh, people are going to be spinning around you and like writing code really fast. And 80% of code is now written with GitHub copilot. Are you, are you at all? Like, what's your feelings on that? Are you guiding people to, Hey, become familiar with these things, learn what they're good at, learn what they're not. Would you rather people just ignore them until they reach some sort of threshold of integration with the software development ecosystem? Or like basically, should people get in early now? Should they ignore? Should they just do what seems interesting to them? Oh, I think you you got to try it. Okay. Um, firstly, like this to me is frustrating to no end. It's like, okay, whether you think that there should be hype around this or not, uh, at least like do not listen to other people talking about this thing that you could just try, just try it. Yeah. Just try it. Like why? And a lot of the people who are expressing opinions have not tried it or they've yeah. tried it like in a way where they're setting it up for a failure or setting it up for success and cherry picking the, the results. Yeah. And so for you to go and say, Hey, uh, like, I wonder if I can get it to do this thing, a good thing. And Hey, I wonder if I can get it to do this thing, a bad thing. And test the limits like you're just going to learn so much more from that than seeing some rando's twitter thread about look what i achieved or look at yeah, how just, dumb chat gpt is painful. it's like just try it <laughs> you can even try the like let's say for some reason you don't want to pay 20 dollars a month firstly as a software engineer you really like you value 20 dollars in cash more than the time that you're wasting listen to other people's takes on chat GPT. Takes, takes are free. Takes, this take is free, Oz, and it's you. So it's good. Uh, no, actually, I'm not a pay. I'm a, I'm going to leave this and pay my $20 so I can try GPT for because I'm not paying yet. Yeah, do it. It's just $20. Yeah. I mean, this whole thing, like you want to like Copilot plus GPT-4 plus Midjourney Pro, you can pay $100 in total yeah. to try all of these things. Like I, so, I have been trying them. I just tried the freer versions. Um, and yeah, I mean, I it's, love it's worth that, twenty dollars to try GPT four. Think yeah. of it as like an amusement park, and you go there and you you get to try this like amazing technology that hasn't existed previously that you can't access anywhere else. Of course, you're going to pay twenty bucks to try out this crazy sci-fi thing. Yeah, you know? I used it for um, for writing. I this is GPT three Chat GPT. I one of the things I've been trying to do is improve the motivation of my characters. And I think I mentioned last time the sort of, I want, maybe I didn't, but there's this, I want motif in many Disney movies, which I'm writing a book for children where you have to be kind of patently transparent about what your, what your character's desires are, what their major misbelief is, how that drives the plot. And I said, uh, I could, you know, I know the Disney movies are patently transparent about their, I wants like they're their songs. Ariel wants, uh, I guess now, now that I'm thinking about it, I think she wants to be a human. And I said, ChatGPT, can you, do you, are you familiar with this trope? And can you describe it for all the Disney and Pixar movies for what each main character's desire is, major misbelief and how they changed? And it was really good. And it was a lot of research. And I, it was good because I knew what they were, but it helps succinctly do this. And that's that sort of research buddy slash you know, I was about to do a Star Wars reference, which I know you're not familiar with, but they have these really cool droids that are their, their best friends that sort of hang around them. And there's no one's worried about AGI and Star Wars, but they have these little, little robots that can help them fix their ships or answer questions for them. And that's what it felt like to me. And I did like it in that regard. And that's why that's why I'll pay $20 after this. It's pretty good. 
Yeah, I mean, I use it okay. like what, what fun thing that you would like actually is that um, the kids can extend their stories. Uh, yes. Maybe this is like me, you know, doing offloading to chat GPT, what I should do as a parent. And I'm uh, negligent like this, but they'll like read a book and they'll be like, oh, but what happened to this character afterwards? And I'm like, oh, the book's finished. And I don't really yeah. feel like being imaginative right now. So let's ask chat GPT <laughs> to oh write a God. story that's like these characters in this scenario and like make it funny and uh, whatever. And yeah, it's wow. not bad. And yeah. you can be like... Um, uh, yeah, and make the story long enough that it takes about five minutes to read. Bedtime story. Nailed Boom. It. Yeah. Love it. And then you just set that on some uh, Amazon Alexa thing and it'll read out loud to them. And then, yeah, you can be doing more podcasts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's like, look, I do want to be a better parent. Uh, I see this as like a little, a little thing. I'm not going to get that much value out of... I mean, maybe I'm wrong and maybe I should practice coming up with those stories myself and uh, injecting more of our like personal experience. You should. It's that, I think that is a rewarding experience. Although what am I doing other than referencing the one, they say there's only seven stories or something like that in human history. I'm just referencing my own crappy internal mental LLM of the various stories and regurgitating them. So uh, yeah, it just it's your little robot buddy. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be stressed out about it. But for, again, for programming, are you are you saying to folks that you should learn not just out of curiosity or is there any sort of like compulsion that, hey, if you don't learn how to do this, the job market's going to move away from you or you're just going to not going to be learning effectively. Like the kids who use calculators are learning better than the kids who don't. There's no you don't you're not fear mongering yet. It's more your take is this is a this is a curiosity and it's sci fi and it's fun. Is, is that my takeaway from what your your point of view is? Is it, are you asking ultimately what should a software engineer? How yeah, software yeah, engineer? exactly. Uh, at the moment, it's not as useful to a software engineer as a calculator is to someone learning mathematics. Um, yeah. Is that a reasonable comparison? It's not. Yeah. Um, I know you could see it as having probably the effect on the job market that something like a compiler had or the first compilers had where it like yeah. opens up the ability for end user programming in a way or SQL. When when SQL came out, people were like, ah, oh, this is gonna like it's gonna totally change programming because now all these people, like business people, don't need to program anymore because they can write SQL queries. Yeah. Declarative. And, yes, it's all it's declarative. And to an extent they were right. You know, it does like does take some technical expertise to be able to write good SQL and debug it and so on. Um, but at the same time it did make it more approachable for analysts to like there are whole classes of problems that used to be handwritten code. And now I just like, well, let's put it in a database and run SQL queries. Um, but, uh, you know, that's like, it's introducing, it's allowing this thing that was a programming behavior before to be a, uh, like business need declaration behavior or whatever. Same with COBOL. Uh, COBOL did change the world forever and Fortran and whatever. Fortran made this accessible to, uh, to, yeah. to scientists in a way where, uh, you know, previously it was people who are handwriting. Uh, anyway, the yeah. Ul you, ultimately, I think you just need to decide what you want to be, like who you want to be, where you want to sit in the in the kind of stack. And once you've done that, it's for, it's fairly straightforward. Like I would like to be. Well, forget me because my thing is computer science education. No, I want I want to know you. Where do you, where do you want to live in the stack? Well, I mean, I'm like, I'm in education. I like programming for fun. I'm always going to do that for fun. I want to get to be a better programmer for fun. I mean, actually, like, can you see what I was distracted by while we were chatting? It was like, this is Conway's game of you, life, uh, APL. How can you look at that and not want to learn APL? Uh, uh, yeah. That's, you know that's I mean? all of it right there. That's, that's something. That's Good an Lord. implementation of Conway's game of life in APL. Wow. Um, like, I don't look at this and be like, I want to learn Apple script. That, that sound, that looks horrific. No, no, no. I don't want to, I'm not saying that I just want to learn to program in every possible language. Wow. They really, so this is Rosetta code that I was talking about before. Okay. I got to check really this out. This is awesome. It's cool, huh? But I look at this kind of thing and I'm like, ah, I, I wonder, do they have a solution in P? P? I'm not, what is P? 
That's another one. Pete's Pete's P I E T. Yeah, the Pete. Okay. You, you've not heard of this uh, programming language before? No, no. I just I I'm just wondering for when you're going to show me brain fuck. Oh no, it's better. Okay. It's better. A stack based programming. It's named after Pete Mondrian. <laughs> you're never going to guess why. Does it, yeah, it outputs as a picture. It doesn't output. This is the program. That's the program. That's the input. Oh, my God. So this is a Hello World program in Pete. I don't understand. What, what like, the, it, does it only have the visuals, are the inputs bound by the visual spectrum of the human eye or something. I, can you walk me through this? I, I, I'm not okay. understanding. As a programmer, you yeah. open up uh, mspaint.exe, whatever your your <laughs> chosen IDE is, okay. and you paint pixels, yeah, which are interpreted by the paint interpreter. So what is red? What does red mean? Oh, I don't know the language. I mean, I, like okay. I would like to learn paint. <laughs> I don't know. The different colors mean different things. And obviously the positions mean certain things. Wow. But this is the, in the input. Okay. Some of these things are just fantastic because. Yeah, th like this is a valid program. Wow. Uh, look at this prime number generator, just beautiful. And then this, this is what really turned me on to Pete as a language. When I saw this okay. program, this is a program which calculates pi graphically. And if you scale it up, you get a more mm -hmm. accurate calculation of pi. Naturally, a more accurate value can be obtained using a bigger program, a physically Naturally. larger program. Naturally. Sally. Fantastic. This is amazing. amazing. Like this, this is a, I would do this for years of my life before I learn Apple Script. You know I, I mean? would, yeah. And this, and I imagine this sort of, uh, if your program was outputting as you were drawing and you just had this crazy nonsense that kept like rappelling out and showing you like that, why is all like, this is should just be built into MS Paint no matter what. I'm Look sure people this are- Hello pretty, world. Just, <laughs> I'm going to play with this after this. This is Don't you have so many questions about this? It's yeah. I, I'm like, do they, are there libraries? Is there a standard library for this? Do people like literally write it pixel by pixel or how do they do abstraction? Is there a way of debugging? Like, is there a step three debugger for Pete that's visual? There are, there's human words in the middle of this that somehow contribute to the program. That's, that was what I, it's just bugging me out. Well, it may, it may or may not. I mean, I also wonder, like, if you were to write a minimal program, is there a way to have, like, an isomorphic editing where you can, like, add pixels with guidance from the from the machine or from for the from the IDE, the Pete IDE that I'm going to write, that, like, allows you to make it visually more interesting without affecting the program semantics? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> why are we talking about this? I, I, I find this kind of thing interesting. Yeah. I think that the skills from this are, are transferable, but that's not why I'm going to do it. Like, I just find it fun. Um, and uh, is that is that the extent of what we have? To, um, you are asking, like, what is it that I yeah. want to get out of software engineering? I'm always yeah. going to find I'm always going to find it fun. But let's say let's say I'm concerned about my job market prospects and I want to, like, have a fallback. Uh, so that I can go in back into the industry and make money. For whatever reason, we need to start from scratch and I need to support my family and I need to like go and work at a company and make money. The, the only way that I'm going to feel confident doing that is by doing things that are too hard for 99% of engineers. Mm -hmm. I'm not like, I'm not going to go in and do the thing that delivers value, but that everyone else can do because three yeah. weeks later, I'm going to have to learn something else. That's super stressful for me. I'd rather be like, what's your hardest problem at this company? Maybe not at yeah. Facebook, but like at a company of a hundred people, sure, I'll say like, what's your hardest problem? What's the problem that no one else can solve? Are people doodling pictures during meetings and you want, and you need to turn those into executable programs? <laughs> I'm your person. 
don't you know what I mean, right? Like, and, and I'm not saying that's a brag, but in a in a relatively small company, I feel like I'm going to be less stressed out by solving the thing that other people don't want to solve that's too hard for them, than by solving something that most people could solve, uh, and just like delivering my value that way because yeah. it's it's going to be easier to fire me, easier to replace me, and even if I do a great job, I'm going to have to learn a new set of skills when that thing you know, changes. And so if that's prompt engineering or whatever, like other people can do the prompt engineering. Those other 10 people can do the prompt engineering. Yeah. And then in a month when that looks completely different, they can retrain. And in the meantime, if there's a problem where someone needs to capture some network packets and like hand parse it because Wireshark is not interpreting it correctly or whatever, I'm your man. Like I'm going to do that uh, and, and have fun because I've done... I've done more absurd things like write peat programs in Hexdump and <laughs> and that that's that's fine too. You know, that's that was my training ground for the thing that you found too hard. Does that, that make I sense? Mean, like yeah, every time I use that pumps I use me up. Chat GPT. If you give me yeah. a hard hard problem and I use chat BT, chat GPT to solve it, I've missed an opportunity to train myself to do the next harder problem. And yeah. it would have been more fun for me to do it in the in the direct way. That, I mean, I, I think I said this at the beginning. I'm not sure. The fun thing is the number one thing for me. I want to, I want to just live in this state of that flow thing, that flow. That's where joy is. I want to be there. Yeah. And so often I'm not there. And I think it's uh, like, I leave the, every time we talk, I leave this thing being pumped up. Like, okay, time to get back in the joy. Yeah. I mean, and I totally understand how some people are in that anxiety bottom triangle and they just need to get out of it. And one way that they're going to get or out the of upper, it. Or the upper triangle. That's, yeah, the boredom triangle. That, that yeah, that's the case as well. Yeah, you need to move to a, to the, the diagonal. You just need to move to the di diagonal. And if the way that you're going to do that is by making things easier, so be it. Um, but over time, you want to do that by improving your skill and finding harder work and improving your skill and finding harder work. That's what's fun. Yeah. I mean, all this that reminds me of, um, have I told you the story of Michael Abrash? Uh, shaving instructions off a tight inner loop. No, you know who Michael Michael Abrash is? This guy. No. I wish I had his book here because, like, it's like. Uh, but um, he he's he's now the chief scientist at uh, at Oculus or Meta, I guess. Cool. Um, and uh, but he was originally known as the assembly programming guy, and he had a column. That was like, uh, you know, assembly tricks. And the book that I'm talking about, he's written many, but the particular one I'm talking about is this like assembly programming guy that's like, you know, yeah, it's big, it's big. Uh, anyway, so he was like, he was, you know, Carmack's second programmer on a lot of the games. And cool. but he's done a bunch of other interesting stuff. And for a while he was working at Microsoft and he has now a... Um, you know, he like now he's an executive, right? So he's he's up on stage promoting whatever Meta is doing in virtual reality, and a story that he tells is from when he was at Microsoft, mm -hmm. working to optimize. Like he's the assembly guy. He's so he's going to be doing optimization, uh, working to optimize a tight inner loop, and uh, so he's got justification. I can't remember was it a Microsoft Word or another. It was like a known Microsoft product. Sorry, what is a tight inner loop? Well, I mean, uh, imagine like you've got a large program and you yeah. could look at any section of this and be like, I could potentially optimize these 10 instructions down to eight or whatever. Okay. If it's just a sequential code that runs once at startup, you're going to get no value out of that optimization, right? You're going to save, yeah. shave a few nanoseconds off. No one's going to notice, you know, in the context of a Stripe uh, mobile app taking a minute to load, no one cares about your nanoseconds. Yeah. Uh, but if it's a loop within a loop, those instructions are running over and over again. And so yeah. if you take that from 10 down to eight, that could be improving the performance of the overall program by 20%. Like, you know, you're just ignoring the constant factor and looking at what's in the height in a loop in that case. Yeah. Uh, okay, so he was working on that, on, on something like a core code that runs over and over again. And uh, I can't remember the exact detail, the exact numbers, but he got it down from like 13 instructions down to 12 or something. And, um, uh, oh no, so he, okay, so let me, let me start that again. He, yeah, 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 fix it, fix it. Okay, 
So uh, again, I don't remember the exact numbers, but he's like, he's working on this thing. And after a while, he's got it, he's gotten it down to 13 instructions in total, let's say. I've got it down to 13. He tells his colleague, I managed to get this down to 13. Colleague looks at it and says, I think I can do it in 11. Uh, <laughs> can you please? Yeah, tell he's me? been working on this for weeks or days or something. And he's yeah, I don't know. Like maybe it was just that day or something, but his colleague is like, hmm, I think I've got an idea for how you get down to 11. And of course, what do you think Abrash says? It's not like, oh, I would love to know what you would do to get down to level. What do you think? Well, I think he grabs it back and immediately leaves the lunch table and goes back to his cave. Of course he, of course he does. Of course yeah. he's like, don't tell me. Goes home, comes back the next day, talks to his colleague. I could not figure out your 11 instruction uh, solution, but I did get it down to 12. Yeah. Yeah. Colleagues like, no, there was a bug with my yeah, exactly. I was wrong. I, I love wrong. it. And and Abraham, you know, it's the motivational speaking context is like believe in the impossible, shoot for the moon, and you'll shoot for the stars, and you'll hit the moon. <laughs> but for yeah. me, the story is about assembly programming specifically, where it's like you, know, you yeah. can take the general, you can take the general uh, uh, lesson from that, or you can be like, oh, I really do want to shave my uh, instruction stuff. But for There's us, a... it's like, of course, he's gonna say, don't tell me. He's not going to let his colleague ruin the fun. Imagine if they did. Yeah, I, spo yeah. Spoiler alert. Exactly. You can't do that. Um, I learned that last time. No, that there's another one I have somewhere here. Soul of a new machine. There's some the some story in there where the they give the intern the project of I think of like writing the virtual machine for the computer they're writing, and they're like, "This is an impossible task. It can't be done." Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm probably butchering this. Yeah. And of course they figure it out. And they, the intern doesn't know that this is an impossible task and that allows them to do it. So not the same sort of like, uh, oh, I'm going to do this because I, uh, you figured it out. It's sort of just like, if you don't know that something's impossible, you can like achieve the impossible. I don't know. It's uh, yeah, no, I absolutely. I, I saw it just the other day, a recording of Orson Welles talking about how like Susan Kane was what it was. And it was because he hadn't made a movie before. And uh, he just didn't know what he wasn't meant to do. And he just like, yeah. he just did what he thought, you know, he could. So, yeah. I mean, that's okay. not to say like you should, you should go in with the naivety of an intern all, all the time, but it's, but you got to take the opportunity for fun and learning and, uh, and work. You got to find the fun in the thing that is going to push you to learn. And Probably. if you're always like, I will allow someone else to answer it for me. It's like chat GPT is doing the work for you. You were getting none of the value out of this. Like, all you got was an answer. Did, is, did you really just want the answer? The journey. The journey is the destination. This is a good point to wrap it up. Yeah. All right. All right. Good as always. See you man. next time. Yeah, that was fun. Thanks.